Hi, welcome to the Challenger 604 and 605 initial online training course. My name is Darren Gates and you'll see me popping up at various e videos throughout the course. Now you should some time ago have received your, all your student course notes and the suggested timetable. So this online content supplements the student notes and you should read through the notes first and then come and do that module online because the module kind of skips a few things but goes over the key salient points so you really need to read your notes for the detail the timetable that I've sent you and you'll see there's hours allocated for each subject they're just guidelines to how much time you might want to need to spend on each subject but you may finish the module quicker or take it a bit longer than what we've written down it doesn't really matter the key thing is though to do them in the order of the timetable because the online content will follow that order and all those exams of which there are four different module exams they're going to follow the, that timetable and the subjects so the first exam will cover all the subjects listed in your timetable up to that point and so on and so forth so we're going to head over now to the PowerPoint presentations for the um, introduction module we're going to look at a few things. Now there, are, there is some content in this presentation that's not in your notes, specifically regarding the Bombardier uh, <coughs> portal for accessing the aircraft maintenance manuals. There's a few, few things on there I want to highlight, so definitely it's worth sticking and watching this video, even though you may be co uh, happy with the content of the course notes and you're happy that you've uh, got all the subjects in your head. Uh, but do s on this particular module there, are s there is some information that you won't find in your actual course notes. So we'll head over now to the PowerPoints and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so the first thing to say is that the Challenger 601, the 604 or the 605, they are just marketing names used by, B by Bombardier. The key designation is what's on the type certificate which is a Bombardier CL 600 2B16. Now this designation covers the Challenger 604, the Challenger 605 plus some later models of the Challenger 601 and you would need to check the serial number to find out if it is a CL 600 2B16 or not. And if it's not a CL600 2B16, the earlier models of the 601 are the CL600 2A12. And also these days, the Challenger 650 has actually also got the same designation uh, as the 604, 605. So the 650 is a CL600 2B16. So technically speaking, this course will cover you for the 604 to 605 and also the 650. Uh, and, and some of the 601s. But the key designation is the CL600 2B16. So let's take a look at the avionics suites that we've got our, at our fingertips. So on the Challenger 604 you'll find the Proline 4 avionics system um, with quite small, uh, six very small CRT screens probably state of the art at its time but it's looking quite dated nowadays. The 605 uh, much better, it's got a Proline 21 avionics system we're going to cover both of these, the Proline 4 and the Proline 21 and very recently, uh, literally December of last year um, they introduced or upgraded a Proline Fusion. This is available as an upgrade on the 604 and also the 605. It's a much much better system just three very large display screens and everything is touch screen it's a very good system unfortunately it's not covered in this course because we simply don't have the uh, data at this stage but they're the avionics suites that we're going to look at and uh, basically then the proline 4 and the proline 21. okay a little bit of a potted history then so the challenger series was it first introduced in 1996 in fact, the earlier ones, the Challenger 601s, they were basically, t the production rights were taken over from Learjet, which was virtually going bankrupt at the time. 
um, and then Bobardia took that over from them and, and then they kind of had the foresight to future develop it and, and basically the Challenger series is still going strong now with the now with the Challenger 650. So it was first introduced in 1996. It's got a just over 4,000 nautical mile range with CF 34-3 series engines. <clears throat> Unfortunately, not FADEC, and we'll look at that uh, later on when we look at the engine phase, but uh, that's a, the unfortunate side of things, is it's kind of mechanically controlled. And configuration for up to 19 passengers, <coughs> although to be honest, 19 passenger configuration, I've never seen an aircraft configured that way, it would be pretty tight um, and not very particularly comfortable, I wouldn't have thought. So, but technically you can carry up to 19 um, passengers. So general dimensions and areas then, um, nice wide cabin actually, and that's one of the first things you'll notice for a small aircraft, the cabin size is, is really good. Um, so we've got an overall width of the fuselage to a cabin of eight foot 10 inches. We're not particularly interested in the other dimensions for the wing there. We'll look at the overall wingspan in, on the next slide. And the horizontal stab wingspan of uh, 20 foot and four inches. So overall wingspan, that's 64 feet, four inches from winglet tip to winglet tip. Um, the winglet from the ground to the top of the winglet stands at nine feet and four inches. And the height from the ground level to the top of the horizontal stab, 19 feet and, four, and 2 inches. For the nose to the very sort of extremity of the horizontal stab, 68 feet and 5 inches. From tip of the nose to the back of where the tail, so, tail cone section finishes, uh, 61 feet and 7 inches. Now, while this picture is up, actually, it'd be good just to highlight the fact that um, visually it's quite hard to tell the difference between a Challenger 604 and a 605 from a, a layman's perspective. But one thing that gives the game away is the shape of the tail cone. You'll notice on this one is a, is a, it's kind of a straight line vertical. Uh, so that means it's a 604. Um, the 605 has got a more rounded tail cone as we'll see in some uh, pictures uh, a bit later on. Um, so I just thought I'd highlight that, that now since uh, the picture's there. Um, height from the ground to the very top of the horizontal stab, or vertical stab I should say, uh, 20 feet and um, 8 inches. So general performance and specs. So uh, as we mentioned, we've got two GE CF34-3B engines, each producing 8,792 uh, 29 pounds of thrust. Maximum operating altitude is 41,000 feet, with a range of just over 4,000 nautical miles, a Mach 0.74. Cruising speed, or max cruising speed, 541 miles per hour. We've got a Garrett APU installed, um, and we can use that for on-the-ground use. Um, and we can also use it in flight to provide electrical power or air for the pneumatic systems. So interior-wise, the, the aircraft can be configured for 9 or 19 passengers, although as I said, I've never seen it for 19 passengers. 9 is kind of common, but 19, I've never seen one like that, uh, with 2 plus 1 crew. Um, uh, now, you'll f you won't find any information in the Bombardier manuals about the interiors because it, it's kind of how long is a piece of string. There are so many different combinations of interiors you can have. So that will be down to the completion centre and there'll be a set of supplementary manuals for your aircraft giving you all your details about your interior configuration. Um, so this kind of, um, and that's very common actually in the business aviation world. There's so many different combinations of interiors, so many different styles, colours, types of seats, seats arrangements. <clears throat> it's just impossible to cover it all. Um, so um, uh, you just have to, when you get out there in the real world, you'll just have to grab your supplementary manuals that come with your particular aircraft and get to know it a bit better. So the next few, few slides just give you an idea of the different possible combinations of interior you can have. I'll just scroll through them and just let you 
peruse them uh, later on if you need to. As I say, what you need to do is refer to the supplementary manuals to get the, the details of your particular one. So pilot and uh, co-pilot seats, these are pretty standard actually and you will find this information in the uh, Bombardier manuals. Uh, actually pretty much anything in the cockpit furnishings wise you'll find in the uh, Bombardier manuals because that kind of standard uh, is just in the cabin, it's different. So obviously we have a crew seat for the pilot co-pilot um, and they're, they're obviously in the flight compartment. Uh, it's kind of an obvious statement but there we are. Each seat has got an inertia reel seat belt and shoulder straps with a lap belt and possibly a uh, crotch belt with a quick release buckle. Obviously the purpose of the seats is to provide comfort and safety for the pilot and uh, co-pilot. So Challenger 604 aircraft are equipped with uh, a Proline 4 avionics suite where we have six main display screens, all the same, all the same part number, all interchangeable. Um, and they're, they're kind of old school now, they're CRT screens. And one thing that strikes you when you walk on the cockpit is how small they are. Um, but there are six of them to make up for it in some way. But um, you'll see, uh, for those of you who've got experience of modern glass cockpit aircraft, you, you'll see how dated this actually is. Um, the 605, of course, has got the Proline 21, which we'll look at on the next slide. So 605 aircraft have the Proline 21 system. Now, this is much better. As you can see, we've only got four screens, but they're much larger, and they're LCD. Um, the basic architecture of the avionics is broadly the same, actually, and, but we'll look at it in more detail when we do Chapter 31. For a few differences, but the basic architecture is the same. It's really just the screens and how we present the information to the crew and how they navigate through things. It's a little bit different, but you'll find the Proline 21 a much better system, certainly in terms of a pilot's perspective. So looking at the general arrangement in the flight deck, starting at the overhead panel, this is where all our systems are controlled from. <clears throat> Coming down from there, you've got your glacial panel, and on there you'll find your master warning and caution lights, plus all the autopilot controls. You've got your main instrument panel with all those six uh, display screens, plus standby instruments on there. Uh, there's a pilots and co-pilot side panels that kind of come around at an angle. Uh, on there you've got some audio panel controls and some air vents. The two side consoles, pilot, co-pilot side. Um, on the left hand side, on the pilot side, you've got the nasal steering tiller. There isn't a great deal of uh, systems on the uh, co pilot side. Then you've got two circuit breaker panels by, their, by the footwell, and CB panel three and four. <coughs> CB panels one and two are behind the pilot and co pilot, respectively. And then the centre pedestal, where you'll find some of the things like the FMS, the radio tuning controls various other systems controls and of course not really showing on that picture but the throttle uh, levers and flap selector lever and speed brake control. Standard safety equipment, <clears throat> obviously life vests in each passenger seat and in the divan seat location in the divan compartment. We also carry some additional life vests in the after wardrobe for the crew. Crew vests for the pilot and co-pilot uh, as per the factory's layout Basically, they're on the crew seats, and there's an additional crew vest in a pouch in the forward wardrobe. So we've also got life rafts. They're under the divan seats in the divan compartment. Uh, we carry our medical kit and first aid kit. That's in the forward wardrobe. We've got some smoke hoods as well for the crew. Um, they're in with the life vests and these crew smokers are in the in located with the crew life vests. Rarely you may see a uh, Kazovac equipped aircraft. Um, this is an STC designed by a company based in uh, Oxford. It's the only one I know of but um, it is an STC, it is commercially available 
uh, if someone wants to equip their aircraft as an air ambulance. Aircraft bungs and blanks, don't really need to dwell on it too much. It's kind of obvious where they all go, and it's the usual suspects that get covered up and blanked off. So engine intakes, APU intakes, etc, etc. Um, we do have a ram air turbine on this aircraft, and the ram air turbine is on the forward right hand side in the nose. And there is a ADG ground safety pin that's inserted, you, you go up through the nose undercarriage bay and insert the pin and it, and it get, engages into the release lock uh, or ADG up lock and stops the ADG from accidentally being deployed on the ground. Apart from that, all the other bungs and blanks are kind of standard that you haven't not come across before anywhere. Uh, standard safety areas or danger areas. Obviously, when the engines are running, you've got the intake area and the jet jet blast. So the this picture shows an engine at idle and engine at full power, um, and the safety zones associated with that. The APU exhaust comes out on the towards the back on the right hand side. Uh, again, so it gets hot there. Uh, one thing you do have to be careful of actually when you're running the APU is not to have the uh, engine cowl doors open because um, it, it gets too close to the uh, exhaust pipe. Okay, looking now at various equipment bays. So the most of the avionics equipment is in the main avionics bay. The access through that is for a small hatch at the entrance to the cockpit. You open up a small hatch and then you kind of wiggle your way down and you can crawl under the floor into the avionics compartment. Not very much fun and it's not very it's very tight in there and small uh, and that's how you access it. You access it through the access hatch in the cockpit or just at the entrance to the cockpit. There's no access on the outside. <clears throat> Another key area is um, in the non-pressurized area just behind the uh, um, where the where the radar bulkhead, uh, where the river radar bulkhead is, your there's a forward electrical compartment, and you can see the four TRUs in there. Now this is the 604. Um, on the 605, they've rearranged a couple of the components. We will go through it when we get get to the individual systems. Um, but this is the 604. <coughs> I'll show you where the access hatch is. Very easy to get to. In fact, there are two access hatches, one on the left, one on the right. And you can get access to that forward electrical compartment where the four TRUs are. So that's the 604. So this is the 605. So the main avionics compartment is pretty much the same. The difference is the forward electrical compartment is in the same place, same access hatch and everything. It's just the locations of some components have changed. So you've still got the four TRUs in there, but on the 605, 605 they reposition the main battery into this compartment uh, with its associated battery charger. Now the, there are two batteries on the 604 stroke 605. The 604 batteries, they're both in the tail section in the aft uh, equipment bay, which we'll look at on the next slide. <clears throat> the 605, um, one of the batteries is still in there, that's in fact the APU battery. And then the main battery they reposition to the front and, and it's in here. So here is the aft equipment bay, which is a non-pressurized part of the aircraft in the sort of tail section, tail cone. Contains the APU bay, or the APU is, is in a container within this compartment. Uh, and this picture so, shows some various avionic kind of LRUs, including the uh, main battery and the APU battery for the 604. Remember the main battery on the 605 is being moved forward to the uh, forward electrical bay. <clears throat> access to this compartment is through an access hatch on the bottom of the fuselage. You open it up and it drops down on a hinge and you can climb up and get into this bay. What this picture doesn't show is that also located in here are the air conditioning packs and number one, number two hydraulic system components. So it's it's, although it's quite a large compartment and you can get up inside there and move around, 
there's a, there is a lot more components than uh, shown in this picture. Uh, so this is the same compartment but for the 605. Big difference being the main battery has been removed and relocated along with its battery charger and there are some minor changes with the locations of the HF. So HF1 and 2 are now on the left and right hand side and it's on the 604 they're both on the same side but apart from that it's probably the same uh, same thing as on the 604. Uh, what you can see from this picture is the 605 shape of the actual tail section. You can see it's much more rounded than on the 604. So we're going to look at some servicing items now. Firstly, hydraulic servicing. So the hydraulic control panel is on the overhead panel in the flight deck. The servicing points for the number one, number two systems are in the aft equipment bay. And for the number three system, there's a service panel on the wing to root uh, fairing at the rear of, rear wing to root fairing on the right hand side. So to depressurize number one, number two systems, you can bring up the hydraulic page on the synoptics. Uh, then you operate the rudder or elevator controls, just cycle them until the pressure reads zero. Uh, big important thing, don't use the ailerons to try and depressurize it. You can cause some damage to the control system. And for the elevator, use a maximum of 10 cycles on the uh, backwards and forwards. <clears throat> you can also operate the brakes if you need to, to get the brake pressure down. Okay, so here's in the aft equipment bay again, and we've got the number one, number two system hydraulic uh, components. Uh, they're on either side, number one on the left, number two on the right. So these pictures are just zooming in on the number one, number two hydraulic system service panels where you've got the service points for the uh, accumulators, the, f the fill point for the reservoir, and also the connections for uh, connecting a hydraulic uh, rig onto the number one, number two systems. The number three system components are uh, located centrally in the main wheel well area, but there's a service panel to top the rigs up on the left hand wing to fuselage fairing panel. Uh, top the reservoirs up, sorry, on the wing to fuselage uh, fairing panel. Okay, external power. So primarily the main external power is AC power, and there's a connection on the right hand side of the nose just around the area where the ADG is. Um, there's also DC external power, but that's only used for APU starting. So to plug in uh, external AC, you uh, open up the panel, you'll see a standard AC uh, power socket there. You plug in your GPU. With the GPU operating on the overhead electrical power panel, you should see an available light for the where the ground power switch is. So it should, it should say available. Uh, to put, turn power on, you push that switch and it will then swap over and instead of saying available, it will say in use. And you need to make sure that the available light part of it is switches off. <clears throat> you can then put the battery master switch to the on position. Um, to turn off power, put the battery master switch to the off position and push in the uh, AC ground power switch again and the in use will disappear and it will say available once again. So external DC, so there's an external DC power socket on the right hand side at the back of the aeroplane, <coughs> just below the engines. Uh, the procedure is very similar then, so you plug in external DC, it should say available on the GP on the overhead panel switch, <clears throat> you can push that in and it will say in use. Um, you can turn on the battery master switch to on, uh, but uh, this will only provide you DC to start the APU, so it's very rarely used. To put power on the aircraft properly, you need the external AC. So, this is for refueling. We've got gravity refuel capability 
one gravity fill cap on each wing for the main tanks and on the right hand wing at the inboard part of it there's a, an additional gravity fill cap that will fill the center tank group there's also a tail tank group but you can't gravity fill that uh, the pressure refueling point is in the wing to fuselage fairing panel right at the root there at the front and there's actually a control panel just above it for doing the pressure refueling. Uh, AGG replenishment, so this is for the resto pump. So there's a small hand pump and a little reservoir for restowing the ADG once it's deployed. Uh, do it by hand when the aircraft returns. Um, so periodically that will need to be um, uh, uh, filled up and it's just got a little self-contained reservoir with hy hydraulic fluid in there for um, re re replenishing it. There are two brake accumulators and the charging points for those are located in the nose wheel well. So the IDGs are on the each engine, they've got their own oil supply. Um, so you vent, there's a vent cap or vent valve, you push in and vent the uh, uh, IDG. And then there's a fill point and an over, overfill standpipe, and you just fill it and allow the oil to come out the standpipe. Once the oil starts coming out the standpipe, you can stop pumping, and then you just let the overflow, overfill standpipe just drain, um, and then you're done. But we'll go into and look at more detail of that when we uh, look at the electrical system. Okay, AP oil. So the APU is in the aft equipment bay, so you need to go up inside there. They, in the APU enclosure, there's a couple of our service doors. Now the APU has got two oil systems, really. The APU itself and also the APU, gearbox, uh, the APU generator um, assembly. So there's two kind of fill points and service points for the APU oil. Engine oil can be serviced at the engine itself, uh, or on the engine itself, on the oil tank. There's a, there's a fill cap and you can just open it up and fill, fill up the tank directly. But probably the easiest way is to use the remote servicing system. So in the aft equipment bay you'll find a big oil tank and a selector valve and a pump. And you can use the selector valve to select which engine you want to service. You turn on the electrical pump and the oil will pump um, to the engine and then stop automatically when it uh, is filled up. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to our friends at GE and they're going to go through the oil servicing with you because there are a couple of watch points just to look out for. Hi, Dave Guilfoyle here with GE Aviation. Today I want to talk to you about the CRJ200 engine oil remote replenishment system. The system provides a quick and simple way to service the engine oil without having to open the cowling. Normally easy to use and reliable. There are a couple of issues to keep an eye out for, however, to prevent adding too much oil to the engine oil tank. Over-servicing the engine oil tank can result in a high oil temperature and service disruptions. So today we'll take a look at the components of the system, we'll go through a quick basic operation, and we'll talk about some of the ways to make sure we don't over-service. Most of the system components are here in the aft equipment bay. The oil replenishment tank contains the engine oil for servicing, and it features this sight gauge. The oil replenishment pump moves the oil from the tank to the engine. The oil replenishment selector valve directs the oil to the left or the right engine. And the oil level control panel energizes the system and contains the indicator lights. The remainder of the components are here on the engine. The engine oil tank contains the oil for use. It has a cap with a dipstick. The service line carries the oil from the aft equipment bay to the engine oil tank. The oil level probe senses when the engine tank is full and turns off the pump. Now this is one area where we need to be aware of possible problems. If the probe fails, the pump may overfill the tank, resulting in high oil temps during operation. 
Down here on the engine is the engine lube and scavenge pump, which delivers the oil from the engine oil tank to the engine components for operation. The pump has a check valve here in the oil filter assembly, which can also cause problems. The check valve prevents oil from draining from the engine oil tank through the pump and into the accessory gearbox. If that valve leaks, it can make the tank appear to be low, which can lead us to over-service the tank. The aircraft maintenance manual contains the instructions for remote replenishment. We'll just walk through the basic operation. First, and most importantly, we make sure that we are servicing the engine within the time limits in the manual. If we wait too long after the engine operation, the check valve on the engine may be leaking and oil could have migrated into the accessory gearbox, which would give us a false low level indication in the tank. If we can't service the engine within the time limits, we'll have to dry motor the engine per the maintenance manual to move any oil that has leaked back to the engine oil tank. If we are within limits, we turn on the power switch and monitor the indicator lights. The power light should come on, and the left-hand full and right-hand full lights may or may not illuminate. If both lights come on, the engines do not require servicing. If either or both of the lights stay off, then we'll press the test to make sure the light circuit is functional. If the lights test OK but go back off, the engine requires servicing. Record the amount of oil in the replenishment tank before servicing. We rotate the selector valve to the left or right engine, whichever one we're going to service first. The pump will come on and the oil will move to the engine oil tank. While we are servicing the engine, it is very important to monitor the sight gauge on the replenishment tank. There is a limit in the manual that specifies how much oil we are allowed to add to the engine before we need to look for problems. Normally, the oil fills the tank, the full light comes on, and the pump stops. Record the amount of oil on the sight gauge, and the service of that engine is complete. If the full light does not come on before the servicing limit in the manual is exceeded, we need to stop and find out why. It may be that the oil level probe circuit has failed and the tank is over full. We can tell by removing the oil cap. Be careful, the oil tank may be over full and oil may spill from the tank. If the tank isn't full, it may be that the check valve in the lube and scavenge pump is leaking and we may have to dry motor the engine to see if the tank fills back up. The troubleshooting figures in the maintenance manual will direct you through the specific steps. The important thing to remember is to monitor the amount of oil that you are using during the servicing to prevent over-servicing of the system and the resulting high oil temperatures. Well, I hope this has been helpful and made the system a little clearer for you. Thanks for your attention and for all the work you do every day keeping our engines flying safely. Have a great day. The air turbine starter needs to be filled up periodically. It's got its own little oil system for lubrication so that you'll find a fill plug and a drain plug. So you drain the old oil out and then you just fill it until it comes, uh, into, basically you fill to spill. You fill the oil until it comes out over the uh, filling point. Oxygen charging point is on the right hand side of the nose. Now you may have one or two oxygen bottles, but the charging uh, arrangement is exactly the same. It's just a single charging point with a gauge, um, and it's, you'll find it on the right-hand side of the nose. You'll find the water service panel on the um, right-hand side of the, just behind the wing root area, and the waste service panel actually on the next slide is just beneath it. So here's the waste service uh, panel or area, uh, pretty standard. Uh, you'll find that on the right hand wing to fuselage fairing panel at the rear, uh, just beneath the water service panel. Ground safety pin for the nose gear. It's in the uh, auxiliary uh, drag brace strut. Uh, pops in the hole that you can see just there. Main landing gear safety pin goes into a, a receptacle in the um, 
high end of the actuator. And actually, when you put it in, you think, well, that pin's not doing anything. Um, the the lock, the ground lock, is actually part of the actuator itself. And we'll, we'll take a look at a cutaway section of the actuator, and you'll see that actually the pin, when you put the pin in, it does do it. It does do something, and it will stop it from uh, unlocking. Um, but don't be aware for it. You, uh, there's a little uh, uh, cover there. You, you poke the pin in the hole, and it will keep the ground lock engaged. This is ground lock for the ground for the ADG. So to to uh, put the ground lock in, you actually go up inside the nose undercarriage bay. On the right hand side of the kind of side bulkhead, there's a, you'll see a hole. So you poke the ground lock pin through that hole. It protrudes through into the um, up lock, the ADG up lock, and stops it from uh, unlocking. In order to do that, you need to actually open the nose undercarriage doors, because normally the doors are closed. Um, and there's a safe, there's a, a pin to operate the nose gear doors. It's actually where the external AC power uh, socket is. If you open up that panel, you'll see tucked away just to the side is a little switch. That that will open up the um, nose doors. And then uh, you can put the switch back in the normal position and put hydraulics on and they'll just uh, automatically shut. When you need to ground the aircraft, there's various grounding points, including one in the nose undercarriage bay and there's a couple on the under wing area. If you need to moor the aircraft outside, there's a couple of tie down points where you can basically utilize the um, uh, jacking points with a jacking adapter and a mooring uh, adapter plate um, and then you just tie it down into hard points on the ground. Okay, towing the aircraft is pretty straightforward, you just hook up and go. All you need to do really is make sure that uh, the nasal steering is switched off and check the nose landing gear oleo extensions not too excessive. Uh, which should be right, as even with a, an empty aircraft, but an aircraft on maintenance with loads of equipment removed, you might find the oleo extension is a little bit too long, um, and you can damage the cams inside the gear. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just hook up and go. Make sure the nose wheel steering uh, is disabled and switched off. There's a switch in the cockpit for that. Jack in the aircraft, if you need to change your wheel, you can put a bulk jack under the uh, main uh, axle, jack up the, the whole leg to change your wheel. If you've got a flat tyre, there won't be enough clearance to get the bottle jack underneath. You'll need a special beam and two bottle jacks to lift it if you've got a flat tyre. For the nose landing gear, pretty much the same thing. You can use a bottle jack to jack the uh, axle. If you need to jack the complete aircraft, you jack it at three points, two under the wing, one just behind the nose gear, and you lift it that way. Once the aircraft's lifted, as a general precaution, you should put a tail steady in position at the, in the tail just to keep it steady. Uh, if the aircraft has got a lot of equipment removed, um, then you need to ballast, put some ballast in. Um, it says there, put a thousand pounds in just behind the flight deck uh, bulkhead cabin on the cabin floor. Um, there is another method which we'll show you on the on the uh, next slide, which involves a, a uh, special piece of ground equipment, which is basically a ballast that sits underneath the nose gear jacking point. But I'll show you that uh, picture on the next slide. So this is a special nose ballast unit bit of GSE that you may or may not have. Basically what it is is a lump of concrete <coughs> on a metal frame. And what you do, you put this ballast unit on a scissor lift, position it so that it aligns up with the nose jacking point on the aircraft. You screw the jacket adapter through the metal frame and then into the aircraft's jacking point. 
you adjust those uh, side pads, item 4, so that they fit sn snugly against the uh, fuselage, and there's a little, like a turn, power, turn barrel adjustment, which is item 3. Once you're happy, then you can lower the scissor lift, and this basically, this lump of concrete is just dangling on the threads of where the jacking uh, adapter goes in. So it's a little bit dodgy in my view, but anyway, it seems to work. So then what you do is you position the normal jack in position underneath where the jack and adapter is, and then you just uh, jack it up, and you've, you've got the nose held down with a, a thousand kilo um, weight. Um, one thing, the open end of the that concrete, the open part of it, you can see it's like a U-shape, so the open part of the U should be pointing rearwards. Okay, welcome back. Well done. That's the first uh, section out of the way. That gives us a general overview of the aircraft. What we'll look at next is the Bombardier technical documentation. So we're going to access the Bombardier website and we'll go through how all the aircraft uh, maintenance manuals and so on are all laid out. So, see you in the next module.